Great Sunday morning to you. God bless you. Thank you for joining us in our worship service here at Mount Zion Baptist Church, 220 North Watterson Street, Kings Mountain, North Carolina. We greet you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Welcome. I'm Pastor Davis. It's May 3rd. We hope you're encouraged about who you are and whose you are. I hope you're ready for a fresh rhema word from the Lord. Stay tuned and enjoy this inspiring song from the Feeds the Family of Miracle Tabernacle with their rendition of the Clark Sisters. Name it, claim it.
Welcome back, family. Again, we're glad you joined us this morning, uh, this Sunday morning uh, that the Lord has made, and we're rejoicing and being glad in it, uh, even though we're still in what seems to be a, a pandemic and a stay-at-home order that seems like it's lasting forever. But we are encouraged, and, and we know that God has a plan, and we want you to be encouraged and remember that God is taking care of you. He's taking care of all of us, and he's going to make it exactly what it needs to be. But we give God glory just for being who he is on this uh, Sunday morning, another day to worship him, another day to give him praise, and we hope that you are right, well right where you are. I call to worship. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. I was glad when he said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you got somebody close to your family, I need you to simply tell them this. Say, neighbor, come on in to the sanctuary. Let us pray. Most holy and everlasting God, it's in the name of Jesus we thank you for another day's journey. We thank you for being God. We thank you for allowing us to be who we are. And we pray right now, Lord God, that this service would reach somebody right where they are. And dear God, it would begin to penetrate their hearts. And that the light of your word would shine and obliterate the darkness. Dear God, we thank you right now that even though it seems as if things are slow moving and it seems that the church doors are closed, but I thank God for the Holy Ghost that's revealed unto me that it's merely been a new church open in every household. And I thank you this morning for all that you are, all that you're doing and all that you're going to do. Thank you for allowing me to be who I am. We pray that you would bless every family, dear God, right where they are this morning. Bless every church that's gathering in the name of Jesus. And we bless your name, Father God, for all your children. Bless all your children, wherever they might be. Preach your word this morning like only you can. We give you glory and invite you as our honored guest to have your way. We love you, God, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for uh, just continuing to, to join us Sunday after Sunday. And, and many of you who, who have uh, given to the ministry and sold into the ministry, we thank you. And we want to say God bless you uh, for allowing God to use you in whatever capacity that, that you have participated and you have uh, been a part. And we give him glory always here at Mount Zion and, and we're a church that believes in, in giving the credit where the credit's due and we know all the glory belongs to him. And so we just want to thank you again today for joining us. Our scripture this morning, if you will look this morning with me to the gospel of Luke chapter number 24. As we continue to deal with this text, um, in the different gospels and we're to the point in the gospel of Luke now where Christ is ascending into heaven. We, we have gone through this Easter season and it was probably the most unorthodox Easter we've ever faced in my lifetime. And we are hovering in these group of scriptures on purpose, family, because sometimes God wants us to really understand what he's saying. And many times to do that, we have to be redundant about what we're doing. We got to get it over and over and over and over and over and over again until it becomes that which makes sense to us, until it becomes life within us. So we're looking at the gospel of Luke this morning, a familiar story that we have been expounding upon for the last couple of weeks, uh, but from the perspective of Dr. Luke, 24th chapter, looking at verse number 44. If you have your Bible, I'll be reading to you from the Voice Bible this morning, sharing with you um, 
and expounding upon this text from the doc, book of Dr. Luke, 24th chapter, verse 44, and it reads, I've been telling you this all along, that everything written about me in the Hebrew scriptures must be fulfilled. Everything from the law of Moses, the prophet of Psalms, and 45 says, then he opens their mind so they can comprehend the meaning of the Hebrew scriptures. It says, this is Jesus talking to them. He says, this is what the scriptures said, that the promised anointed one should suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, that his name, a radical change, that in his name, a radical change of thought and life should be preached. And in his name, the forgiveness of sins should be preached, beginning in Jerusalem and extending to all nations. You have witnessed the fulfillment of these things. This is what he's saying to the disciples. So I'm sending my father's promise to you. Stay in the city until you receive it, until power from heaven comes upon you. God bless you. May God add a blessing to his red word. And may it be seed sown in good soil, bring forth 30, 40, 60, and 100 fold. And we want to talk briefly this morning, if it pleases the Lord. Uh, and if we don't get through it all, we'll pick it up next week. But we want to talk about this morning leaning or learning to walk by faith. We want to talk about learning to walk by faith. It's been some about seven years ago when I was in Atlanta, Georgia for a uh, weekend with, with my family, with my wife's family. And this is before I was a pastor and preaching. And I went to, I think it must have been First Baptist Atlanta and, and set in on a uh, sermon uh, with Dr. Charles Stanley. And he was talking about faith that day. And he came from the Old Testament uh, which I'm not going to touch on today, but there's some scriptures in the Old Testament that will absolutely tie into this text. Um, and, and, but we're talking about walking by, learning how to walk by faith. And, and as I'm studying this week in, in my office, uh, if you know anything about pastors in their office, sometimes it's a, it's a process. People say it's, it's junky because you use it, but that ain't the case for me, I don't guess, all the time. But I run across this sermon or the sermon notes that I took uh, from Dr. Stanley that day. And, and I just want to share what the Holy Spirit spoke to me through the notes that I took some seven years ago about walking by faith. And, and one of the first affirmations when we look at these scriptures, family, the, the 24th chapter of Dr. Luke, uh, one of the first after affirmations that we see of this text is that the Holy Spirit pointed out to me uh, this week, and it was some redundancy going on. Uh, and Jesus is very redundant with the scriptures. And he's reminding men in the text uh, of the prophecy of the Old Testament given by Moses and the prophets. And, and what it revealed to me and what it reveals uh, is, is life in the scriptures are a practice and a constant reminder that is perfected only when we are willing to revisit it over and over. Somebody said amen. New revelations are, are displayed as we, we look closer and closer at every detail that is carefully placed within the scriptures. Hear what I'm saying now. Every detail that's carefully placed within the scriptures as we recap time and time again. And so the scriptures stated in, in if you look back into the Old Testament, some, some things that the Holy Spirit led me to, if you look back into the Old Testament where Deuteronomy 11 and 18, uh, this is the New International uh, Version text, it says, Fix these words of mine in your hearts and minds. Tie them as symbols on your head and bind them on your foreheads. Look in uh, Proverbs and, and 
It says, Proverbs 3 and 3 says, in the New International Version, it says, let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the table of your heart. Proverbs 6 and 21. It says simply, bind them always on uh, your heart. Fasten them around your neck. Proverbs 7 and 3. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the table of your heart. What I'm trying to say to your family this morning is that the only way that that the scripture becomes life in us and the only way that it becomes written on the table of our heart is that we go over it time and time again. We constantly reminded of the story of Jesus Christ. We're constantly reminded of everything that we learned in the Bible and we go over it time and time again. That's why the word don't change. But our relationship grows deeper with the Lord. And as our relationship grows deeper, that's why we can read the same scriptures for 95 years and get something different every time. And Jesus is redundant in the text this morning because he is giving it to the disciples over and over again. He said, this is what I was telling you when I was already when I was here trying to prepare you, getting you prepared for my departure. And family, I came to tell somebody this morning, if we're going to learn to live by faith, we have to learn quickly. and We have to learn to be redundant over and over and over and over again. So, for example, it's much like a relationship that forms over the course of many years. Married couple who's been together for 50 plus years, though they know one another, they're still learning new things daily about one another's heart. And the chambers of a man's heart and mind have hardly even been revealed unto himself. And and so he grows and he finds out new revelations about himself And upon self-discovery and a period of of study within himself, he then reveals these truths to his significant other through his actions and his heart by which he lives. And, And what are you saying, Pastor? Well, if you would testify and tell the truth that this is the truth of the matter for all of our lives, we find out new things about ourselves on a daily basis. And then we allow our heart to grow a little bit. And and even if we do it inadvertently, we share those things with our significant other through our actions. It's much like uh, the football team that practices the same play over and over again, tweaking and, and perfecting the execution of the play so that the rhythm and the timing become so in sync that even if there's a blitz or a busted play, the level of effectiveness has become so great that the offense is still able to advance the ball. That's what studying the scripture is like. Redundant over and over again, practicing the same play. And even if you get blitzed by the enemy, you done perfected it so much, you done read it so much, you done allowed it to become life in you that even if you get blitzed, you still can advance the ball. Because even though the opposing team may know the play and and the execution of it, what the opponent cannot account for, family, is the bond and the relationship that the quarterback has developed with the running back, the wide receivers, and the offensive line. And these relationships allows them to operate as one unit. That is developed from spending hours on end with one another, learning tendencies, habits, and and, and teaching us how to make room for one another. Teaching us how to make room for one another and operating as one unit. It allows a relationship between teammates that grants them access to intricate workings of one another's heart and mind capacity, which simply allows me to know you. And how to adjust to our situation or circumstance so that we can continue in success even when we're striving, the success that we're striving for, even when we get blitzed. What are you saying, Pastor? Well, I'm simply saying that when we know each other, we are better equipped to have faith in each other's abilities, in each other's uh, work ethic, in each other's intentions thus empowering us to learn how to walk by faith. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm saying that when we know Jesus, it better equips us to have faith in Christ. 
it better equips us to have faith in his ability, which better equips us to have faith in his work ethic and in his intentions, thus empowering us to learn to walk by faith in every word that proceedeth out of his mouth. Tell somebody we learning to walk by faith. Two times in the scripture uh, this morning in the scripture lesson that that Christ um, has the same conversations. If you pay attention, go back to verse number 27. He's having the same con- uh, conversation with two other men. But then as we get down to verse number 44, we, we see that Christ goes back and he explains to the disciples what he had been showing them in the days before he was crucified. He reveals all uh, all that they were distraught about had to happen. Everything they were upset about, him being crucified in such a horrific death, he reveals unto them that it had to happen in order for the law of Moses and all that had been prophesied in the Old Testament, in order for that to be able to come to pass. It was necessary for him to suffer this gruesome and painful but joyous death. How can you say it was joyous, Pastor? Well, that's easy because he was about it was the death and the, the crucifixion on the cross, the grave and all that he was going through was the only thing keeping him from being one with his father again. If a man would actually stop and survey the accounts. Now, get this. Christ had a lot of work to do. Get this. He, he was born around 5 B.C., history says. The earliest recorded time known to man is around 4000 B.C. And so Christ had to fulfill the law, the history and the prophecy of about three thousand and ninety five plus years. And that ain't all. He also had to do it in thirty three years. And to complete the mission, to make it even uh, harsher, he had it was reduced down to a three year ministry. And where the bulk of the work was done was right there in the three year ministry that he had. So what are you talking about, Pastor? I'm talking about living by faith, family. And how is it even possible that he's able to fit so many things into uh, uh, 33 years? It's easy by faith. Second Peter three and eight reminds us that we should not forget this one thing that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years. And, and with God, a thousand years is also like one day. What's the point, Reverend? All I'm simply trying to say to you this morning, this family, is God does not move according to a timeline. He is not bound by time. Time has no dominion, nor does it exist in his presence. And for this reason, God intends for us to develop our faith. And in developing our faith, we must learn to wait on the Lord. I believe it was Jeremiah, I believe it was Isaiah, I'm sorry, 40th chapter, verse number 31, and and it says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. Tell whoever is near you that we're learning to walk by faith. And family, if we're going to learn to walk by faith, it requires us to wait on God. If you look at verse number 45, it says that he opened their minds to the scripture. How did he open their minds to the scripture? Well, he he, by telling them again what is recorded in the scripture. Jesus is still teaching the disciples how to hear the voice of God. He's teaching them how to listen. He's teaching them what the difference between the still small voice. Some of us miss God because we don't recognize his voice. We don't recognize his voice because we have not allowed the Holy Ghost to open our minds to the scripture. In this faith family, to know the scriptures are a must. It's something that we got to begin to practice daily. It's something we got to be redundant about. It's something we got to be religious about. A lot of people are so religious that that they don't understand that you need to be religious about your relationship with him, not religious about the rules and the set of things that's going on. But be religious about your your prayer time. Be religious about your your meditation time. Be religious about uh, Bible stuff. Be religious about working the faith. 
And it's a must that we know the scriptures. Uh, To know them means we have to spend time with them, learning them. We're never going to know the scripture if we don't ever sit down and read them, fam. We can only learn the basics of the character of God in the scriptures and the sacred text that he has outlined for us through Moses and the prophets and the disciples and the Old and New Testament books. We have to learn his character in order to learn his voice. I'll say it again. We have to learn his character in order that we know his voice. When we learn his voice, we can learn to listen with an attentive ear. Some of us are listening, but we're not hearing anything. But when we learn the voice of God, we can learn to listen with an attentive ear. Many people are hearing his voice and they call it God. But if the voice that is heard is a contradiction to the word of God, I got news for you, family. Then it's a hundred percent chance that that voice is not God. Because God does not contradict his word. And learning to walk by faith means and requires us to listen to God. If you're taking notes this morning, we, we, we are required to listen to God. We're required to wait on God. We're required to learn his character. And listening to God, family, requires us to learn his character, his ways, Despite contrary belief, God does not try. God speaks. And I love the movie, The Color Purple. And I love to hear him sing that song, God is trying to tell you something. I'll tell you, I get happy every time I hear. But the truth of the matter is, is he does not try. He speaks. And when God speaks, he's very specific. The amount of details that one receives is according to how tune His or her ears are. I'll say that again. God speaks. And the amount of the tales that you receive, family, is according to how tuned your ears are. Let me share something with you this morning. If you are not in tune, there's going to be some some conflict in what's going on in your ears, in your heart, and in your mind. Because despite contrary belief, singers can't sing well if they're out of tune. Musicians, they can't play well if they're out of tune or if their instrument's out of tune. Relationships don't flow well when they're out of tune. Athletes can't perform. Governments cannot be effective. Pastors can't preach. Churches do not thrive. And church members can't operate. And the children of God cannot hear when they're out of tune. And learning to walk by faith, family, means that we must learn to walk in tune. How is it that I walk in tune, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked. Because learning to walk by faith and walking in tune means that we have to learn to obey God. We got to learn how to obey his every command. And I said it many times before, family, that partial obedience, despite contrary belief, some folk think, oh, this is enough right here. I can just do this right here. This will be enough. When God gave you a command to go the distance with the thing. And sometimes even in relationships, I don't know if there's a glitch in the system, but but sometimes the men, we we don't we tend to not give our whole heart. We tend to not open up completely until uh, we we feel like that, you know, it's the right time. And, And women, I don't know what's going on there either, but maybe somebody is telling us, well, don't do everything they say because then they're going to be controlling you. Y'all, that's a glitch in the system. (laughs) Partial obedience is disobedience. (laughs) Somebody going to get that. We must learn that there are consequences to every action. There are consequences to every action. And many times and more times than other times, A positive result comes from obedience. And disobedience yields a consequence as well, family. Get this. If a farmer does not till the ground in the dead season, the ground will not be ready for the planting season. If the ground ain't ready for the planting season, no seeds go in the ground. No seeds in the ground, no harvest. It's that simple. 
we're learning to live by faith. As we look down at verse number 49, family, Jesus, he reveals in verse 49 that he is going to send the promise that the father is committed to. But he, he gave instructions to wait in the city until you have been fully clothed in the power from on high. Did that point go again? Wait on the Lord. He says, wait in the city. I'm going to send you the promise that my father is committed to. But I need you to go to the city and wait until you are fully clothed in the power. Some of us don't want to wait. Some of us want to hit the ground running. I remember when I first started preaching and my pastor pointed out to me because I had some questions for him. I was like, well, pastor, I used to be a praise and worship leader before I was a pastor or a preacher, and, and praise and worship was easy because I had done it for so long, and, and it was easy for me to tap into the Holy Spirit. But this preaching thing, I used to scratch my head. You know, where the Holy Spirit at? How can I tap in? I, I, it, took some, it took a process for me to learn how to tap into the Holy Ghost as I was preaching, and I had some questions from my pastor. I said, Pastor, why can't I uh, tap in? Why can't? He says, son, you got to understand. You just dropped out of the womb. You were just born. And you think you can just take off running like a seasoned vet in the game and get mad when you can't. <laughs> That's some of us. We just birthed into something that we want to run at, at jet like speed. Never stop to learn the process. Never stop to slow down a little bit so we can be uh, trained and we can be well seasoned before we take charge of us. We just want to come in and take over. But Christ said, wait until you are fully clothed. From in power from on high. What does that say? That preaches that we, when we come into the midst, if we're going to walk by faith, we got to allow our faith to develop. We got to allow uh, ourselves some time so we can begin to hear the voice of God, the way he's speaking to us. We got to allow the Holy Spirit's voice to become loud within us. So that we know that we know it's the Holy Ghost speaking and it's not that other fella telling us we need to go act crazy. And some of us think we can just come into the church house and act like we acted in the world. Sit down for a while and wait until you're fully clothed in the power from on high. Amen. So the promised family that Christ is speaking about in this text this morning, he, he's talking about the Holy Spirit, better known as the Comforter. I think one of the other uh, Gospels uh, names him as the Comforter. And so he's promising to send back the comforter because he says, I'm going to be with you to the end of age. I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm going to be here and I'm going to go back to the father for if I don't go back, the comforter won't come. So I'm leaving you in good hands. You don't have to worry. I got a plan for you. I'm going to send back my voice so that you can hear me even when I'm gone. So after he had reassured them family and reaffirmed their faith, in verses number 45 down through 48, he, he reaffirms their faith by being redundant and telling them things he had told them before and going back through the scriptures and the laws of Moses. He goes back and, and, and he teaches the disciples that they had to learn to depend on him. Came to tell somebody this morning, if we're going to live by faith, if we're going to walk by faith, we not only have to develop our faith, we not only have to learn to hear his voice, we not only have to learn how to trust him, but we got to learn to depend on him. And living by faith, family, it, it simply means we have to learn to depend and trust on his every word. Learning to depend on God teaches us how to trust him. Just as a child learns to depend on its parents or its guardian at a very young age. I shared the, the testimony before when, when you go down. Back in the day, we used to run through the woods and, and you got to the big creek or the big ditch, whatever you called it. And you had an older brother or a parent with you and they said it's all right to jump. That's when we felt comfortable to jump. Because we knew that they had our best interest at heart. We knew that we could trust them and we knew that we could lean on their word. Well, that's all God is requiring of, of us, family. If we're walking by faith, we got to learn to depend on him and trust him. We got to learn to depend on God and learn to depend on his every word that proceeds out of his mouth. So that just like the sheep, he is the voice of the shepherd. Do you know that if there were 
1,500 sheep outside of an establishment, and there were three shepherds on the inside, and each of them had 500 sheep each. Do you know that the sheep will not move until their shepherd calls their voice? He will not come. If the other shepherd comes out and calls his sheep, they go. The others stay put. But just like the sheep begin to hear the, and learn the shepherd's voice, we got to learn to walk by faith. And it means we got to learn to hear and trust the voice of God. When we shut out the voice of God, family, as we move to our close this morning, when we shut out the voice of God, I need to paint a picture for you. You shut out the voice of God. We open the door to pain, affliction, and destruction. And this morning, I want to share with you that as you begin to develop your faith, and as you begin to, to work out your faith, it's, it's a redundant process, something that has to be done over and over again. Don't get frustrated that you didn't get a grand rhema of word the first time you read it. Keep going back. Read it again. Don't get frustrated that, that other people are able to draw out something grand and profound. And you're just getting something real simple. That's all right. Let me tell you something. The way that they got to that grand and profound message is because they kept on reading. But I want to share with you this morning that my Bible tells me that as Jesus began to reinforce their faith by recapping all that he had taught them, as he makes his exit and begins to ascend back into the presence of the Father, the Bible says that he blessed them and confirmed to them that the comforter was to come. I came to tell somebody that if you're going through a rough time right now, and, and you feel like you can't hear the voice of God. I came to tell you that the comforter is not far away. Because every word that Jesus said, you can believe it to be true in your heart. And he said that he was going away so that the comforter would come. And I came to tell your family that all you got to do is tap into the comforter. All you got to do is begin to dive into that word and stay right there. Read it until you read it, until you read it all over, and you've read it 10 times. And if you still don't have nothing, read it an 11th time. Because Jesus assured us that he was sending a comforter, and the comforter would lead us into all truths. He assures them that he will be with them until the end of ages. And I came to tell somebody that he's with us by way of the Holy Ghost right now if we would just reach up and grab him. In other words, though I'm not here physically, he's saying to the disciples that the comforter will be my spirit to guide you into all truths. The comforter will be my voice to lead you in the path of righteousness. I wish I had somebody that wanted to be on the path of righteousness this morning. The comforter is the guide that leads back to God. And I want to encourage you this morning to reach out to the comforter this morning and allow him to speak to your heart and encourage you along your life's journey. For the comforter is the encourager that teaches us the ways of God. And when I'm in a rough situation, I came to tell your family that the comforter is the one that tells me that the Lord is my shepherd. When I'm going through some bad times in my life, he comforts me and tells me that he is my shepherd and I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures and leadeth me beside the still waters. The comforter tells me that he restoreth my soul for his name's sake. And yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I don't have to be afraid because he, his rod and his staff, they're with me. The comforter tells me and reminds me daily that weeping may endure for but a night, but joy comes in the morning light. I wish I had somebody 
somebody that was happy about it right where you are. The comforter reminds me, family, when trouble rises up against me, the comforter will hide me in the secret place of his tabernacle. The comforter reminds me that can't nobody do me like Jesus. I heard the old folks say it. The comforter reminds me that he has a plan for my life and the plans are to prosper me and not to harm me. The comforter reminds me, family, that when my enemies and my foes come up against me to eat up my flesh, the comforter reminds me that they will stumble and fall. The comforter reminds me that it was grace that brought me safely thus this far, and it's grace that's going to lead me home. Jesus said, I'm sending you a comforter. So you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be distraught. You don't have to be messed up and put out that that I got to go away because I'm going back to be with the Father. But I'm going to send you what you need so you can be ready on that great getting up morning when it's time to meet me in the middle of the air. I'm going to send you my voice. And the way that you hear my voice is you got to walk by faith and not by sight. Family, it's important to note this morning that learning to walk by faith, you're going to have some ups and downs. It's just like a relationship. We walk by faith. We learn in that relationship that we can trust the person to lead us. God is no different. The good news is, is he don't ever walk away from the relationship, even when we turn our back on him. He's always standing there waiting for us to come to our senses. Thank you, Lord. And walking by faith, family, it, 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 it allows us to allow him to be Lord and Savior. I've said it many times before, many of us will allow him to be Savior, but all of us won't allow him to be Lord. Walking by faith. You're not alone, family. Listen, Abraham had to learn to walk by faith. Moses, Paul, Jeremiah, Noah, Joshua, Jesus, the disciples, Isaiah, David, and many, many more. They all had to learn to walk by faith. And, and, and sometimes we make faith more complicated than it really is, family. It's simple. The simplicity of faith is merely merely the action that you show when you walk into a room and you turn the light switch on and before the light is completely illuminates the room, you already in the room walking around because you had the faith that when you hit the switch, the light was going to come on. These are the simplicities of faith. Some of us pay insurance payments. And some of us done outlive the insurance policies. But we had the faith that when we paid that insurance policy, if something would have happened, it was going to take up. These are the simplicities of faith that we exercise on a daily basis. Yet we find it so complicated to have faith in the one who did everything for us. Every time you stick your key in the car and you turn the key, you got faith that it's going to crank up. Even when it start acting up and it won't crank right, you still sitting out there hitting the key. Come on, somebody. That's faith. Getting married, family, that's a faith journey. You have to trust that you and the other person have enough to make it. I ain't talking about enough stuff. We're going to do a workshop on stuff (laughs) and why it's not necessary. But you've got to have enough faith in the other person that their love is enough to keep you encouraged, to keep you going. Simplicities of faith are simply when you deposit your money in the bank, you got faith that it's going to be there the next time you need it. Hmm. What are you saying, Pastor? I'm simply saying we put our faith in all of these things 
that are tangible to us. It's time for us to begin to develop our faith in God to a greater capacity even than we have the faith in these things that we see every day. For when we begin to develop our faith, we'll begin to get hungry for the scripture. And when we get hungry for the scripture, we'll begin to read about him daily, learn his character. And when we begin to learn his character, we'll know his voice from the other guys. And when we begin to hear his voice, family, that's when we'll start moving at jet like speed. That's when we'll begin to shake the foundation of the world. That's when we'll begin to be able to disciple men and women. Because when we're willing to hear his voice and obey it, then we've been discipled ourselves. God bless you. I hope that the word blessed you this morning. Learning how to live by faith. We'd be remiss this morning if we didn't give you an opportunity to make Jesus your Lord and Savior. If that be you this morning, we, we know that the scripture, Romans 10 and 9, says that if you believe in your heart and confess your sins, that Jesus Christ died, rose from the grave. If you believe in your heart, you shall be saved. And so if that's you this morning, I... It's redundant. And some folks say Sunday after Sunday, Pastor, why do you still make that, that call? Because it's part of the Great Commission. Go ye therefore into the world, baptizing men, discipling them, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. If I don't give you an opportunity to come into the family, I, I'm not operating into, in the commission. And so if this is you this morning, if you'll pray this simple prayer with us and repeat after me, Father, in the name of Jesus, I confess my sins. I confess that I've sinned and fallen short of your glory many times. But, oh God, I ask you to forgive me right now. I believe that you died, was buried, and resurrected just for me. And I want to be adopted into the family. Save me, Lord. Come in and take residence in my house, this temple that you allow me to live in, and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Family, if you prayed that simple prayer, we believe you got saved. ED. Can't be undone. And I encourage you to get into a Bible teaching church somewhere that will allow you to grow and allow you to go to work for the kingdom and allow you to find your place in the kingdom. God bless you. Let's pray for those of you that just need prayer and you'll know somebody that need prayer. If you'll come in, in the altar of your heart right now, right where you are, I believe that if you come right where you are, that prayer can reach whoever it needs to reach in Colorado, in California, in Hawaii, China, wherever they might be. If you'll just come in the altar of your heart this morning. You'll see God do miraculous things. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come on behalf of all of your children who have come to the altar of their heart this morning, desiring prayer, standing in for prayer for someone else. And simply God just coming for a blessing. You know what they stand in need of. So we ask right now in the name of Jesus that you would supply the need according to your riches and glory and according to your plan for their life. Oh God, have your way. Move throughout this world. Help us as the church to begin to humble ourselves and pray. Turn from our wicked ways and acknowledge you and allow you to heal the land. Have your way, God. Continue to bless us through this COVID-19 situation. And dear God, we, we, we feel we're at the brink of coming out. 
So God, we pray right now that when we are allowed to come out of this, that you would help us to come out with some sins and, and help us to come out and not be frivolous, but to be careful so that we can continue in what you called us to. We believe that we have your love and protection, but we also know we are not to tempt the Lord thy God. So, Master, we pray in the name of Jesus that you would even touch the leaders of this nation and all the nations around the world, our president, Congress, our governors, state officials, county officials, city officials. Bless them, Lord. Break their heart for what breaks yours so that your children can be taken care of. We know that you love justice. We read that in the Sunday school lesson about a week or two ago. So, oh God, we pray right now in the name of Jesus that if they're not willing to do the right thing, that you bring justice and put somebody in the positions that are willing to do the right thing. Father, we come because you said we could ask. And so we come right now in the name of Jesus, asking that you would have your way. Bless the ones that are sick. Heal them, oh God, in the way only you can. And help us to do our part in this land. For we realize that we were ordained and created to worship you. We give you glory now and forevermore. These are your servants' prayers. Bless us this week as we go forth in your name. Help us to be who you called us to be. Help us to do what you called us to do. Help us to ration out that which you've given us to give away. And help us to keep what you gave us to live by. And help us to never forget and forever give you the glory for all things great and small. These are your servants' prayers, and it's in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. God bless you, family. It's been a pleasure. We hope to see you again. Good day.
God bless you, family. Thank you once again for joining us. We hope you got something you could use for your journey this week. That's the whole idea, to give you something you can use on a daily basis. That's what the Word is all about. I want to encourage you that if this ministry is blessing you, that you'll go on to Giblify and bless the ministry. It helps us to keep the ministry going. We thank you. We bid you Godspeed this week. God bless you. We love you. And remember, this thing that you're going through currently is simply another day's journey.